Hello students, welcome to UPG Parchala. I am Dr. Vail Pandian from Alinda Institute of Medical Sciences. Today I am going to talk to you about the model about working principles of HPLC and its applications part 1. This is from uh, the paper Techniques in Molecular Biophysics 1. So today's lecture I am going to talk to you about the basic construction of HPLC, working principle of HPLC and uh, how we characterize an, an HPLC chromatogram. Basically this HPLC is, uh, the, is derived from the chromatography technique, high performance liquid chromatography. The performance has increased from a simple liquid chromatography. So I hope that you remember a botanist, a Russian botanist Sweat first uh, uh, demonstrated the separation of keratinoids in a column, thereby the name chromatography derived. Chroma means color, graphy, the technique through which its separation happens based upon color. So it's chromatography, where we are using liquid, therefore is a liquid chromatography. So sometimes instead of liquid, we use gas, therefore it is derived as a gas chromatography. There are some fundamental rules through which the separation happens. Today, separation science has become a very big area in which the HPLCs are commercialized and uh, you know apart from a normal high performance liquid chromatography, today we got ultra high performance liquid chromatography where a conventional uh, pressure which is tolerated by HPLC has tremendously increased and uh, you know we, we, we thought earlier, we thought that we won't be able to uh, go above the uh, dimensions of normal HPLC. Today we have we have gone further and we could get inside a finer, much more finer separation than one could think of. So today let me just explain you more about uh, the HPLC. In HPLC, different types of HPLC are being used. When we try to categorize them for our understanding, I would say HPLC itself can be defined as high performance, high pressure or highly priced. Anyone will fit for this P, high performance liquid chromatography or high pressure liquid chromatography or a highly priced liquid chromatography. But when you just get inside the machine, we need to understand that the separation happens in the chromatography is based upon few fundamental rules. It could be adsorption, could be partition, Sometimes the principle is by size exclusion or ion exchange. HPLC is an instrument which is used to, to separate and quantify the compounds from its mixture. By and large, when we try to differentiate the types of HPLC, I mean the methods employed in HPLC, you divide this into two types basically that is isocritic and gradient. Isocritic means the solvents which are used in HPLC are always kept in same proportion and they are not changing. But the solvents they change mutually then along with time it is called a gradient. The HPLC based upon the nature of the compound, the slowly slowly it gets eluted from the column and it is getting detected in the suitable detector. Basically HPLC contains two fundamental things. One is mobile phase, another one is stationary phase. The stationary phase here is the column and the mobile phase is the solvent which, through which the solvent which is used to elude the molecule is the mobile phase. Now based upon the application, for our convenience we, we try to classify them into different ways. When you just look into it, a normal phase when the HPLC developed, people prefer to use normal phase that means polar stationary phase and non-polar mobile phase. Silica was first compound which was used in this HPLC columns for separation in which an organic uh, solvents like ethyl acetate or uh, you know benzene, chloroform, tetrahydrofuron, all these things are are used, uh, non-polar solvents are used for the separation. That is why it is called a normal phase. 
what is normal about it the silica is hydrophilic upon which hydrophobic solvent was used then came reverse phase what we have done we converted the stationary phase as hydrophobic upon which hydrophilic solvents are used the hydrophilic solvents are water based solvents i mean they are miscible in water and any ratios water methanol acetonitrile are used in most of the applications in reverse phase chromatography the stationary phases are predominantly silica based but surface modified with non polar carbon chains like c8 carbon chain or c18 carbon chain sometimes the surface modulate been modified with phenyl ring so that you get different types of column chemistry ion exchange chromatography in which the stationary phase is uh, would be having a resin and that is it could be sometime cationic resin or anionic resin based upon which the mobile phase would be changed from the mobile phase would be uh, using aqueous solvents which we having a uh, different different uh, uh, ionic compositions for its solution next comes size exclusion of course the size exclusion won't come under the high pressure liquid chromatography this classically comes under low pressure liquid chromatography in which predominantly the gel silica gel is used with the pores larger pores which is used for the separation of larger proteins and polymers these kind of columns are used for isolation of antibodies isolation of uh, isolation and purification of particular peptide immunoglobulins for all these purposes sex exclusion chromatography is much used let me try to show you the basic parts of the hplc in the simple representation what you see here is a mobile phase reservoir in which sometimes what you see here is an isocratic hplc in which water and methanol water with astonitrile or methanol alone are mixed together and kept it in the bottle and uh, it is being degassed sometimes the uh, the primitive hplc systems never came with uh, inherent or uh, with uh, along with the uh, degasser online degasser so it's always important that we used to do the degassing in our laboratory either by sonicating or by using filtration assembly to remove the dissolved air as much as possible then you try to uh, pass it pump it through uh, with the help of a pump it is constantly flow i mean allowed to flow in in a rate which is specified usually 1 ml per minute or 2 ml per minute or 0.5 ml per minute depends upon the column the column in the pump never produces any pressure it works only for uh, the flow rate but the pressure is exerted by the column depends upon the particle size of the stationary phase if the particle size decreases the surface area increases and the pressure increases back pressure increases in between the column and the pump injection port is kept usually in most of the hplcs today almost 99% of the hplcs use a reodine injector is a very nice a good technology through which without disturbing the flow uh, you can inject the sample once the sample is loaded it just applied on the analytical column where the mobile phase is continuously eluting on the column so slowly the separation happens the compound which is having higher affinity towards the stationary phase stays more time in the column the one which is having a low affinity for the stationary phase elutes so in a typical c18 column when you try to run benzene and acetone acetone run comes first and then comes benzene for a mobile phase with 1 is to 1 astonitrile water or methanol water so when it comes out they should be able to identify by using a detector the question comes up what is the nature of the compound if the compound is having uv absorption you may like to use a uv detector to know in i mean continuously you want to monitor for the presence of any analyte coming inside by using uv detector of a particular wavelength or if you are using a fluorescent detector you will be dialing it for a particular emission and uh, excitation in emission to get a particular uh, fluorescence and uh, if you are trying to if a compound doesn't have any one of this kind of character or if the contact is sort of, sort of a sugar and uh, you might like to use a refractory detector in which the refractory changes are monitored and uh, all these signals which are being generated in the 
detector is getting converted into an electrical signal either it is uh, integrated by using a integrated or by using a software this is getting converted into a visual display and uh, uh, as a result the eluting compound creates a peak in the output device and based upon the height of the peak or the area of the peak the calculation is done for various grades of or various concentrations of a standard from this calibration curve you try to understand an unknown compound a concentration of an unknown compound concentration of a substance which you want to quantify <clears throat> what you see here is the uh, modular hplc which is completely integrated one this is uh, having three components distinct three components uh, there uh, are lined up in series the lower one the lower most one is the pump which is uh, shown there inside where uh, the solvents which are coming from the top are being pumped by the reciprocating pump in a particular pressure this uh, hplc is coming under the classification of ultra high uh, performance liquid chromatography here the pressure which is which is this capable of standing the pressure up to 15000 pounds per square inch which is uh, which is multiple times higher than that of a normal hplc but this can handle the column which is having a particle size of 1.5 micrometer also so uh, before this you have uh, uh, online degasser membrane degasser it's uh, it uh, it tries to remove the soluble air in the solvent thereby you know you don't have a chance of uh, mixing uh, making bubbles inside the uh, detector cell so it is also coupled with uh, the auto sampler uh, one and uh, the pumped solvent goes to the next compartment just about here what is shown there is the uh, membrane degasser the membrane degasser as i told you that it removes the air then from here the solvent is being pumped towards the next compartment that is uh, just right above this uh, pumping station the solvent is getting transferred but before it is getting into the column it goes through a uh, injector port and uh, the injector is an auto injector here therefore to make the auto injection possible so what you see here is the compartment which is for column and injector and here is a sampling port is having a robotic arm through which the sample is being picked up from the 96 well plates and been uh, by the syringe and it is uh, uh, loaded into that uh, um, reodine syringe reodine injector and the injector is pneumatically controlled and it works uh, once on the get the trigger it uh, it opens it up and while opening it it feeds the sample inside the column and the when the column the column what you see here is a small uh, one that the whole compartment is uh, thermostated i mean thermo jacketed so you can keep the temperature constant for uh, working at it is also it enables us to work with the higher temperatures also where it requires uh, uh, the setting of temperature at higher play higher digits about 40 degrees centigrade or 45 degrees centigrade is possible and after leaving the column it reaches into the detector here the detector is a, a photodiode array detector and this detector is continuously monitoring uh, for all the available uh, nanometers it's from 190 nanometer to 700 nanometer now it is set for uh, a particular range and uh, from there the element goes into the mass analyzer for as a sample feeder so here the hplc working as a sample feeder for the mass analyzer where this goes and fed into the uh, esi mass or you see above are the reagent bottles this is a quaternary pump basically capable of handling four of the four of the solvents together it enables us to go for isocratic as well as gradient run in different run rates uh, right from you know if you go you ask less as uh, 0.1 ml per minute we go even less than 0.1 minute or two uh, two ml per minute is possible to reach with this and uh, right now it is going to the drain but when it is required we connect it with this assembly so that it is fed into the mass analyzer for direct analysis of the eluent which is coming inside it gives both uv data as well as uh, mass data the signal which is uh, obtained from hplc is being processed by the software 
what you see here is the ultraviolet spectrum at a particular wavelength what is it there are two peaks what you are able to see at a particular wavelength of uh, uh, 270 but you are getting a two separated well separated peaks what you are able to see but uh, whereas this inform this, uh, this this shows only one particular wavelength however you will be able to see more information about other peaks by using another option that is as we are using a photodiode array detector here i am trying to show you both the application of both uh, single channel uv detector as well as the purpose of you have a PDA detector. See here, look, you get a three dimensional view of the structures. Here, you know, completely in one dimension, you are having uh, time in minutes, and another axis, you are having a nanometers that is UV nanometers from 200 to 400 nanometers, and in the y axis, you are having absorbance in milli, milli absorption units uh, milli absorption units together this gives a three dimensional view of the peaks we are getting emerged out of this this chromatogram shows the separation in the uv in single channel let me explain you column separation methods which uh, if you want to if you just get inside a column what you see over there in a bonded silica column what you see here is the stationary phase uh, you see here typically a column in which uh, usually it is made up of a stainless steel to withstand very high pressure. It is packed with uh, silica or with uh, a modified material which is having a sort of uh, end fittings through which uh, filters are kept in both sides and uh, the solvent is allowed to pass through it in a standard column in which if we just get inside further you see a different beads of silica having a different particle size. In a standard analytical column, about 5 micron particle size is mostly used in analytical separations. Today, we have even 1.5 micron columns and uh, 3.7 mic 3.5 micron columns. And sometimes, about uh, 30 years back, we have even used 10 micron particle size columns. So, whenever the particle size goes small, you will get a lot of back pressure. So, basically, silica is easily available. It is is uh, chemically inert. It gives enough tensile tensile strength, and uh, it gives uh, is a good matrix, and uh, which uh, fits into all criteria for a material to be used as a stationary phase, as it is non-reactive, and salinal groups use another advantage for chemical derivatization into different polarities. For example, if you attach a C eighteen, as as you see in the picture. The silica packs in when you try to derivatize it with the C18 chain, it gets converted to a C18 column. That is a normal phase which is having a silenol group as a hydrophilic silenol group is getting converted into a hydrophobic C18 chain which is highly hydrophobic. Now when you are passing a solvent through this, hydrophobic solvent like hydrophobic solvent like acetonitrile or methanol, they try to adhere to this C18. And thereby, you are trying to create a sort of a partition between two liquids. This partition is making partition chromatography effective when you are using you know, two solvents together, especially water and astronitrile or water and methanol, etc. Sometimes, we use directly only one solvent that is methanol. When you use methanol, it behaves as an adsorption chromatography. When you use two solvents, it, it behaves like a partition chromatography. That is how the columns they are behaving in the HPLC which allows you to separate the compound. This picture shows you how these uh, silenol groups are derivatized chemically to make it hydrophobic. Now the surface hydrophilicity is now getting converted into derivatized silica gel with the different groups. Sometimes it is even derivated with the amino group, sometimes it is derived with a phenol group sometime with a C18, C4, a C8, C4, C12 or C18, C30, all these things are derivatized on the surface to make, uh, to give interface for different sort of polarity for separating nonpolar compounds. When you just try to compare the column along with its polarity, this picture explains you how they are equivalent. When you have a normal phase silica column, which is hydro in nature which is equivalent to water but C18 if it goes to the extreme corner C18 
which is hydrophobic column and for which it is equivalent, the polarity is equivalent to that of hexane. Therefore, crisscrossing them. For silica, we use hexane as a mobile phase. For C18, we use water as a mobile phase. So, intermediate solvents like methanol or that side benzene are mixed it together to get a variation in the polarity to get a smoother separation either by using adsorption or by partition principle. Let me just tell you a thumb rule which is used while choosing the type of columns. In case of the compound, based upon the type of compound, we choose the stationary phase, especially the chemistry of the stationary phase. If it is a neutral compound or if it is acidic or basic, reverse phase is best. So, the crux, the important uh, indication or important uh, use of using reverse phase is you will be using water based uh, mobile phases in which you will be able to play around with uh, either pick reagents or by using pH modifiers. It is a thumb rule that you know about the pKa of the compound that is, uh, you know, if you know the pKa either you go this side or that side of pKa, you will be able to get the compound unionized. That unionized compounds are more hydrophobic. Therefore, you try to adjust the mobile phase in such a way, the pH of the mobile phase, so that you are little above or below the pKa of the compound. Thereby, you make the compound unionized. The unionized compound stays more time in C18 column. So, by using this principle, you will be able to make the compound to stay for more time to get it separated over the period of time. So, typically mobile phase used here are water or organic modifiers. The second type is ionics, basic and acids. When and it comes to this kind of compounds, you may prefer to have an ion pairing reagent. But sometimes it is very difficult to elute some type of compounds. So, especially uh, simple aliphatic, uh, aliphatic compounds are very difficult to elute by C18 column. Therefore, ion pairing agents are used. This ion pairing agents make some sort of a bonding with this analyte and that helps it to make it hydrophobic temporarily in the column. Thereby, it can be eluted either by C8 or C18. Again, water along with the pick reagents are used that are typically ion pairing reagents. The compound, if it is not soluble in water, then you have to use a normal phase then in which silica, amino or cyan or diol columns can be used along with, uh, you know, organics, organic solvents. Here we can't be able to use water-based solvents. Our ionics, inorganic ions, sometimes when you go for inorganic ion analysis, in that case, ion exchange mode has to be used, ion exchange columns where aqueous buffers and counter ions are used, here exotic conditions are used to do the elution. Sometimes the pH, you won't be able to see that pH in reverse phase, those pH ranges are used for this operation. In case where the compound is having higher molecular weights or polymers, you have no choice except to use size exclusion chromatography uh, like poly polystyrene uh, silica or uh, using mobile phase gel filtration, especially aqueous gel filtration reagents can be used. The chemistry based separation preferences, you know, when you just look into the array of things what you have. In the polar solvents, uh, you have acidic, neutral and basic. If it is acidic, you have to go in the acidic pH, especially to make it unionized. Therefore, you can go for an exchange or polar exchange, not a graphite or uh, anion exchange or uh, reverse phase mixed mode can be used. Or uh, if it is neutral, non-polar, mild polar or highly polar compounds, highly polar solvents, especially reverse phase, polar retention uh, or a helic column can be used. If it is neutral, polar solvents when we are trying to use it. Our basic uh, compounds, you have to go for, uh, I mean, alkaline pH to make it unionized so that it can be eluted out. Here, you have to use cation ion exchange or polar tension or uh, RP chromatography, these kind of things can be used for a basic compounds. But basically that most of the column, you should be careful about the range in which column could work upon. Safely that, you know, most of the columns work between uh, 3 to 7, all the reverse phase chromatography columns. But going beyond 7 or less than that of 3, you will definitely damaging the column. Thereby, you have to work into the column chemistry, which is suitable for getting into this kind of pH Basically, otherwise, a silanol hydrolysis is uh, uh, unpredictable. The whole uh, so the bed will be disturbed by that way. 
So non-polar solvents are used for normal phases only, and all polar solvents are used for both all, all acidic, neutral, and basic molecules by using different type of pH uh, range and uh, different type of columns. Enough amount of preference to work with uh, polar solvents. This typically when you look at the uh, HPLC chromatogram, all of you know about you get peaks, but the peak is, uh, so for example, one side you have absorbance, on the scale, in the x-axis scale, you have time in minutes. Now, the most important thing is that how much resolution you are getting it for peak A and peak B. Peak in HPLC, as far as HPLC is concerned, the peaks has to be clearly isolated from each other. The method optimization or method validation, everything is, everything is coming only after understanding the peak separation is reached very well. And it fits into the qualities of a fine start and a fine end of a peak. So the one which is uh, the faster moving compound is less retained in the column. Then and the slower moving is more retained. Basically, if it has more affinity towards the column, it goes slow, as I told you before. Usually, the peaks, uh, peak area is quantified by the by a simple uh, mathematical uh, equation, but based into height by two. But uh, you know, but this is a pretty old method. But we use uh, by different type of the uh, parameter. We try to uh, scale the area of uh, peak, or uh, sometimes we even use we even use the peak height to quantify uh, the amount of substance. Now, at various concentration, the standards are injected into HPLC and uh, graded series. So, the standard response what you are getting and the multiplying response what you are getting as a peak height increase or a peak area increase is noted down. With that, calibration curve is plotted and uh, using that calibration curve, the unknown concentration is determined by a mathematical calculation. A typical chromatogram what you see here you need to understand few terminologies. Sometimes what we call it as a void volume. Void volume is a empty volume which is not having any peak. Basically, the this shows how much volume of uh, solvent is in between the injector as well as the column, I mean as well as the detector. So first, this whole amount of uh, solvent we represent as volume zero. Any compound which is emerging out, which is not retained in the column, will be emerging at VO, that is V0, it will be coming out, so which is not retained at all. So after that, the separation start taking place. So understanding the void volume is very important while determining a capacity factor or a separation factor. A capacity factor is something that how good your peak is getting separated from the void volume, that is very important. By using this uh, very simple equations, we try to determine that. A separation factor is another dimension which shows between two peaks how good the resolution you are getting it. That is what is explained by a separation factor. When you are trying to run typically an HPLC, in which suppose if you are running with 1 is to 1 uh, methanol water, when you just try to inject a compound like you, pure, you inject a pure acetonitrile and you will be getting a notch. That notch shows that some sort of a negative deflection. It shows that First, the compound is coming out, which is not retained in the column. So you see that is a V0, that is a void volume, in which you are not expecting anything which is retained is coming out. I have explained to you already about uh, the columns, column chemistries, about the peak illusions, about the void volume, etc. Now, when I come to the detection technique used in HPLC, typically it depends upon the compound, the character of the compound or uh, the uh, you, the choice of UV, the choice of detector is purely depend upon the capability or character of the compound which is of interest. If a compound is capable of absorbing ultraviolet radiation, so ultraviolet light, then it is detected in the UV. Or if it is a colored compound which the color can be used to detect it, you might prefer to use a visible wavelength. Ultraviolet is for compound which is colorless and having a high molar extension coefficient, you will be able to do by UV. Mostly UV detectors are quite sensitive to detect most of the compounds. But the compound does not have any absorbance, you have to look for other property. Photodiode array is another detector which is an extension of a UV detector. In a UV detector, typically you will be measuring a particular wavelength continuously. But photodiode array detector in which continuously you will be detecting 
all nanometers over the period of time. A differential refractometer is the detector through which you try to identify, you try to quantify the changes in you know uh, refractiveness of the medium. This is suitable for sugars and substances which which are having uh, which are having the capability to change the refractive index is monitored. It is a pretty non-specific detector to work with. Next is fluorometric detector where a fluorescence is employed here. Fluorescence is one of the very fluorescence spectroscopy is one of the very sensitive technique, very accurate and uh, you can reach uh, literally you know you can exceed UV detector capabilities but only problem is all the compounds are not fluorescing. So the compounds which are capable of fluorescing can be detected by this way. Next is the electrochemical detector. Electrochemical detector is one of the widely employed detector for the detection of neurotransmitter once upon a time. Uh, the electrochemical detector works based on the basic fundamental of redox potential of a compound. So its amphirometric or colometric detection can be achieved by electrochemical detectors. Next comes mass detectors. Mass detectors are pretty sensitive, pretty accurate and different modes are capable of fingerprinting a compound to the highest accuracy possible. Next comes evaporative light scattering detector. This is again a non-specific detector used for compounds which are not having any specific properties, especially uh, plant extracts can be used to, uh, the ELSD can be used to detect plant extracts where we get a non-specific peaks without any proper character. It just, uh, you know, a light scattering is the principle which is employed here. What you see here is the schematic representation of a UV detector in which uh, I just tried to simplify this diagram where we have two lamps either a tungsten, tungsten lamp gives uh, a wavelength between uh, 380 to 750 nanometers where deuterium gives a uh, UV that is from 190 to 400 nanometers deuterium gives continuum. So these lights are switched on and off depends upon necessity and where we have a grating which is helping us to determine or we try to separate a particular nanometer which is of our interest and which is used to isolate a particular wavelength and it has been uh, is fed to a sample where the sample cell in which continuous flow of uh, mobile phase is happening and after it is the emerging incident emerging ray is allowed to fall on a photodiode or a photomultiplier where it is it is coupled with an output device to get a uh, continuous monitoring of what is coming up in the elute from mobile phase from the column and continuously when you are monitoring when the compound comes up you started getting the signal this slide shows you uh, how a zoni turner monochromator works it's a grating which is on the on the surface of this zoni turner grating monochromator in which light is allowed to fall on them and it, it splits into webgr and a slit allows a particular wavelength when you just try to move the grating then you will be able to separate uh, a particular wavelength to go out through the split and this is used uh, in older versions of uh, this kind of uh, uh, detectors we used nikol prism but this is uh, largely replaced by this zoni turner uh, monochromators it is something similar to that of if you just look at your uh, compact disc that is CD if we just angle it towards the light you will be able to see WebGR coming out uh, using the same principle this is also working. Now let us see that how this photodiode array detector is much different from the UV detector. Now here the light is allowed to pass through empty cell which is containing the mobile phase continuously running on and it is allowed to refract to different uh, wavelengths by the uh, grating and the different wavelengths are allowed to fall an array of photodiodes. So uh, each and every photodiode is having a particular wavelength to deal with. Therefore continuously one will be able to monitor different uh, absorption of compounds in different nanometers. So here you get a three-dimensional view of the data and this data can be uh, in one single run you will be able to understand more than one compounds having a different uh, uh, molar extension coefficient at different wavelengths. All these things can be observed. It is something, it is a next uh, version of uh, ultraviolet detection with uh, multiple wavelengths can be done simultaneously.
factors affecting the efficiency of separation in HPLC. See, there are many, many parameters which need to be optimized while considering or while we trying to improve the efficiency of separation in HPLC, especially flow rate. Sometime that we wanted a quick separation, therefore, we try to increase the flow rate, but the flow rate can modulate a peak shape. When you go in a slower flow rate, the peak might get widened or if you go in a higher flow rate, you might get a high back pressure and shut down or the, column, the peaks are not resolved well. So, appropriate linear velocity is required for high efficient separation of compounds by HPLC. Second one is column length. Although that increasing in column length can increase the separation factor between two peaks, but it eats away the sensitivity of that system, sensitivity of that particular method because uh, when you go increasing the length of the column, the peak broadening is unavoidable. When the peak broaden happens, then we'll, you'll be losing the sensitivity of the method. Next is about particle size. The particle size of uh, silica, uh, silica beads or modified silica beads inside the column, it matters a lot when it comes to efficiency. When you go lower particle size, the surface area increases more, so the plates increases more, so therefore uh, you will get a very accurate separation, a beautiful separation. However, it also increases disproportionately, it increases the back pressure where if I just compare 1.5 micrometer uh, particles with the 10 micron particles, there would be a pressure difference of 800 pounds per square inch to 15,000 pounds per square inch. Therefore, a bad Nittberg equation explains this kind of uh, problem in analytical separations. Therefore, you need to choose the column which is of your interest considering the type of machine what you are trying to use it on. Next is about distribution of particle size. The uniform particle size, if they are, you get much more uh, better peak shape. If it is not, you might set as one. Column bed packing. The bed packing is another important parameter, but however, if you now today, we never go for packing the column as commercially available columns are packed very well. So, this kind of problems are not much encountered right now. Porosity of the packing. Sometimes people try to drop the column on the floor from a height of one meter or one and a half meters from the bench, working bench, which can disturb the pack and it can cause porosity, it can cause uh, cracks in the column, they are the, you know, that uh, it can cause voids. These voids uh, uh, will, will be causing, uh, these voids will cause malfunctioning of the column, especially when you get a separation. The porosity is very important, that is also uh, governed by, you know, the size of uh, molecule you are trying to work with. Sometimes uh, for protein, you look for it for 300 amps strong pore size, they were because the proteins are big in molecular size. So, the pore size is very important for a type of molecule what you are trying to work with. But at any case, the porosity increases in case if the bed is disturbed, then it is called as a white column. Volume of injection. The volume of injection is another parameter. You try to keep it as small as possible. If you try to increase the volume of injection, you might get a disturbance in the sensitivity of your compound. And the type of solvent which is used, that is the last point, the strength of the injection solvent can also vary the separation which is caused. The temperature, viscosity and the tubing length, all these parameters can defer the, uh, or it can alter the efficiency of the separation by HPLC. Especially when you are working with uh, uh, solvents uh, of having high uh, methanol concentration, you would get higher viscosity, thereby you get high back pressure as compared to the same proportion when you with astronitrile and water. So students, uh, let me just now, let me summarize what we have seen or what we have learned from this today's module. We have seen about the basic construction of HPLC and various parts of HPLC and about their functions, columns used in chromatography and uh, the separation science behind it and their types too. We have seen about uh, typical HPLC chromatogram and uh, uh, detection methods being employed in HPLC for uh, getting the signal about the presence of a compound. Thank you.